probably know it off by heart, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Valley of Shadows. Twenty-third Psalm, one of the most famous passages of Scripture. Psalms about halfway through the Old Testament. So we read in Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. I love that part. He restoreth my soul. Amen. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> he guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. It's been said that life is short and death is sure. Sin is the cause and Christ is the cure. We have a hard time considering what a life was originally meant to be like because all of us have known death in our lives. Of course, not personally, but we have all lost people that we love to death. And we all do face the fact that someday we will also die. We watch ourselves aging constantly. Uh, as we get older, we find, I find, at least I do, I find muscles hurting that I didn't even know I had, you know? <laughs> But we notice this, and, but the beautiful thing is that we, as we notice it, and, and working in a nursing home, I see it as well, is, is I see people either take one of two ways of looking at it. And one is, you know, well, I'm nearing the end, and the other is, wow, I'm nearing the beginning. Amen. Vladimir Lenin, the, the first communist dictator of Russia, he died in 1924. And shortly after his death, the authorities decided to maintain his body in a mausoleum. So for the past 95 years, Lenin's body has been on display in Moscow. And day after day, crowds of people come by and they pay their respects. And they think it's incredible because, you know, his body looks so good. The mummy's encased in a glass coffin, it's climate controlled. Um, said he looks extremely lifelike. But what they don't understand is when everybody leaves at the end of the day, workmen come in and fix them again. There's hardly anything left of them, you know. It, it's all plastic and makeup anymore. Uh, they said that his nose, his face have been resculpted a couple times. His body has to be re-embalmed every other year. It's almost as if they're trying to defy death, making it so that it didn't happen. He was such a great man that he's even, you know, he, even his body won't decay. But it's all an illusion. And over the centuries, many cultures have tried to do the same type of thing. Egyptians, they built mysterious pyramids to preserve their dead. Chinese emperors would be buried with hundreds of clay statues of soldiers. Uh, Vikings dressed their fallen warriors up in armor and they sent them off to sea in burning ships. Native Americans would bury their dead with weapons and tools to use in the happy hunting grounds. All of this was done in an attempt to defy the cold grip of death. And if they couldn't think of a way to defy it, they would try to pretend it wasn't real, that it wasn't going to happen. Uh, just avoid the topic. Louis XV of France, he, he actually, it was forbidden to discuss it in his presence. You couldn't even talk about that. A Chinese superstition holds that discussing death, even mentioning it, invites it. And, and even today, let's face it, it's not a great topic of conversation. You, know, you, you meet somebody for the first time, you sit down at a table, what do you say? So what do you think it's going to be like when we die? You know, it just doesn't come up in conversation, right? It's something we avoid. Inevitably, no matter what, it makes people a little uncomfortable. They postpone discussing it as long as possible. 
anyone who's ever had to have that discussion with their children about your life insurance. You were, and kids don't want to hear about that. You tell them this is what I want, you know, this is who I want to have this when I pass. They, that I don't even want to hear about. It. I don't want to think about it. But it's necessary to talk about and to think about. A comedian once said, he said, it's not that I'm afraid to die, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> But no matter what we do, unless Jesus comes back in the sky, before that happens, we're all going to die. And a lot of people are very uncomfortable with that truth. Hebrews 2.14, it puts it this way. It says that mankind had all their lives been held in slavery by their fear of death. Think about that. Held in slavery by fear of death. Philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, he says that Death removes all meaning from life. And, and Aristotle, he would say that the thing he feared most was death because it appeared to be the end of everything. You can understand why folks think this way. Death is the end of physical everything. It is final. But it's wrong. We shouldn't have to die. That's not the way things should have been. That was not God's original design. Death came into the world when sin came into the world. We think of all the other things, and we'll talk about what happened in Genesis 3, the, the curse of mankind when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. And, and all of those things, and we talk about you know, rain, we talk about hard work, we talk about weeds, we talk about pain and childbirth, all of these other horrible things. But death is also a part of it that we just tend to avoid in the discussion. God created us to live forever, but sin has robbed us of that blessing. So many folks, especially non-Christians, they'll come up and they'll say things like, you know, well, if God is such a God of love, why do these bad things have to happen? Mm -hmm. um, if, you know, if, if God is this, if God is that, and they'll, they'll go on. People will tell me, you know, uh, yeah, I, I grew up in the church, but you know, I lost my religion the day whoever passed away or was taken for, especially if it's a tragic or a violent death. Um, God must not love me if he would let that happen to me. So like I said, there's so many different ways that people look at this. But the essence is God created us to live forever. It was sin coming into the world that changed that entire, entire plan. And in stark contrast to the uneasiness and the fear that death creates, David makes this simple statement. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. David didn't try to defy death. He didn't try to avoid it. He didn't even seem to fear it. He regarded it as a, as a place of shadows. Maybe even an adventure. Something I'm getting, uh, this is the guy who would go off and kill 200 Philistines for, you know, as an afternoon activity. So, you know, he was a different kind of person. I get that. <laughs> but yet he was known as a man after God's own heart. You know, I, I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up hearing my father preach every Sunday and actually heard him preach every day. <laughs> you know, and I would hear these, you know, the lessons in, in the... The, the Bibles were always in our house. The scriptures were everywhere. We were always reading the Bible. We were always praying. You know, God was the central figure in my home growing up. And that was a wonderful way to grow up. I get that. But of all the things that, of all the lessons I heard him speak to me, the biggest lesson was whenever the doctor told him that he was dying of cancer, that there was nothing more they could do for him, and that he would ultimately meet his end is the way the doctor took it or put it. And, and, and that was the first time I saw my father really show emotion about that. Uh, he, hadn't, he knew he was sick. He knew he was struggling. He knew how bad this was. Um, and we thought, well, this is it. This is where he's going to break down. But his urgency was to tell the doctor, to argue with the doctor that he was not meeting his end. He said, no, I am not meeting my end. He says, Howard, I'm sorry. You're going to die. He says, that's not what I'm talking about. He said, this body will wear out. But my soul is just starting. It's not my end. It's my beginning. And he grabbed the doctor by the hand and he said, and I want to see you in heaven. Do you know Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Amen. 
And I'm thinking, wow, you know, it's like I'm afraid if I share my faith with somebody, they're going to think I'm a kook, you know, and I might get a little embarrassed, you know. Here's my dad dying, of, and the most important thing in his life was bringing somebody else to Christ. But that's the lesson. That, that's the one. That's what he's been trying to teach me all his life. And it took him dying for me to learn it. David talked about the valley of the shadow of death. And some have maintained that he was talking about the Kidron Valley. It's a deep valley. It's basically in darkness most of the day. Uh, if you've ever spent any time up in the mountains, you'll notice there's a, a light side and a dark side of the mountain. Uh, generally, it's the since the sun rises in the east, you're going to see uh, a lot of times the, maybe the northern end, or depending on the topography, uh, it's, there's going to be one side that doesn't get near as much sunlight as the other. Well, the Kidron Valley is so deep, and the way the canyons and everything sort of go, nothing's quite even. So a lot of the sunlight is blocked out. It has been a place over the centuries of unimaginable evil. A very, if you will, a dark place. Worshippers of Baal, Moloch, they offered their children as sacrifices. In addition, if you were to visit there today, you'll find that this valley is lined with tombs. In short, it can be a very scary place to visit. Have you ever been in a cemetery at night versus the day? It's a little different, isn't it? It's odd. I heard the story of a guy who said he was walking past the cemetery at night and these two young girls came up beside him. And they said, can we walk with you, sir, because we're really scared. He says, yeah, he said, um, this is a very scary place. He said, it used to terrify me when I was alive. <laughs> scary place to visit. So imagine this, this valley. It's literally the valley of the shadow of death. And maybe David noticed his flocks being nervous as they passed through this valley. Because predators love darkness. They love to hide in the darkness so they can sneak up on their prey. It makes sheep very uneasy. Maybe he himself was uneasy as he led his sheep there. But somewhere along the line, he comes to this conclusion, even though I'm in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. So why? Why wasn't he afraid? Because that's not the end of that verse, is it? I will fear no evil because God is with me. I will not be afraid because God is with me. I remember taking a group of Cub Scouts camping one time down Jamonville. And inevitably it rained. It always rained when we were camping. And so we couldn't have our campfire. So they brought us all into the big lodge. And we were all, they built a big fire there in the hearth. And, you know, they did the typical things. And they, instead of the campfire, we had the hearth, the hearth fire. And, you know, these boys, they were all five and six years old. They were young men. They were all puffed up. They had their, you know, their little tiger cub t-shirts on. And they had their, their hats. They were ready to face the wilderness, you know. But they forgot that when we came back out to go to our tents, now it was dark. It was a whole different story. And we had to go back to the campsite through the woods in the dark. And these brave young men, they were one of these. Until I held their hand. And suddenly they weren't afraid anymore. And when they, the camp, when the uh, scout leaders, when we had those, those boys' hands in ours, then they were just as strong, and off they went again. And I thought of that verse when Logan grabbed my hand, and he's ready to go now. All the courage in the world filled back into his heart. He wasn't afraid anymore. No matter where I go, I'm not afraid because Daddy's with me. And that's what David is saying in his song. I will fear no evil because you're with me. How can I be afraid if the creator of the universe who, who loves me is with me? There's a difference between going into a scary place alone and going into that same place with somebody that you trust. Amen. There was a woman, she was telling about her favorite spot at the local zoo. It was called the House of Night. And it was a place that was designed for the nocturnal creatures. Bats, snakes, whatever's most comfortable living in the woods at night coming out. Possums, one of my favorite animals in the world are possums. I think they're just the coolest thing. 
<laughs> and, uh, but all the creepy, crawly creatures of the night are in this part of the zoo. And she said that one day when she stepped into the exhibit, it was total darkness. And she felt a small hand grab her. She said, well, this is odd because I didn't bring a child with me. <laughs> and she smiled and she says, and who do you belong to? And the little voice said, I'm yours till the lights come on. <laughs> Someone once said, I would rather walk with God in the dark than go alone in the light. Amen. Scary places and scary situations can frighten us if we have to face them alone. But God says you don't have to. One of my favorite Old Testament stories is about Joseph. His brothers hated him. They beat him. They threw him in a pit. They sold him into slavery. And for the next 17 years or so of his life, it was miserable. He was either a slave or he was a prisoner. But yet in Genesis 39, we read these statements. The Lord was with Joseph. His master Potiphar saw that the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord caused all that Joseph did to succeed in his hands. The Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And again, the Lord was with Joseph. Five times in Genesis 39. Despite all the things that are going wrong in human terms in Joseph's life, he never was without God. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. So at least five times in one chapter, we're told over and over again, God was with Joseph. Why, why would that show up that many times in one chapter of the Bible? Because if you didn't know God was with him, you would wonder where God was. I mean, Joseph endured terrible hardship. He was just harassed. He was, he was always conscious of the fact that God had not left him. Hebrews 13, 5 makes it so clear. I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Amen. So not only did David believe that God was with him, he believed that God would defend him. I will fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now I don't want to get into real deep theology on all this, I just, but I do want you to understand a shepherd's rod, it's a staff, it had two purposes. Uh, one was to keep the sheep in line, which, let's face it, guys, we need that once in a while too, right? And a second was to use against the enemies, the natural enemies of the flock. Wolves, bears, lions, whatever. So the safety of the sheep depended upon the shepherd being willing and able and equipped to defend a flock. Left on their own, there was no way these sheep could defend themselves. You guys know what a sheep looks like? Flat teeth, slow, clumsy. No claws, weak. And you know what a wolf looks like, right? Strong, sleek, claws, fangs, powerful jaws. Left on their own, sheep are defenseless. They're probably one of the most vulnerable animals ever created. Without the, without the shepherd, sheep are basically groceries. Now, I was watching ESPN the other day because now they're talking about football again, so I'm really interested in it. Which my wife will contend that football season never ends. It just perpetually continues. And she's probably right. But the one guy was on there and they were talking, and I forget who he was, but they said he was one of the most famous um, you know, smack talkers of, uh, of all time. And uh, you know, he could get the other team just so fired up by the things that he said, and he could get in their heads, he could distract them. And I was thinking that there's a passage in the Bible that has some of the, the best smack talk I've ever seen in my life. And it's David and Goliath. Mm. David goes out to, and he's going to face the giant. And the Philistine, he says to him, he says, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, with a javelin. But you see, I come to you in the name of the living God, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down and I will cut your head off. 
And David goes on. I guess he started to really feel it, right? Because he goes on and he said, And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the field. And all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. For the battle is already the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. This is like, this is amazing. You know, I was thinking of, you know, someone like, like Randy standing up here and Tristan coming up to fight him. That's what it would look like, right? <laughs> David's not afraid. There's not an ounce of fear in this guy. He knows exactly what's going to happen. He knows that the Lord is, I mean, the Lord created Goliath. The Lord can take, take him out. David is simply saying, I'm not afraid of you because God is on my side. God is with me. He will deliver you into my hand. You see, David had a shepherd. He knew that without God, he didn't have a prayer. But that was never going to happen because he knew that he would never be without God. Because not only does God promise to defend us, to be with us, he's going to lead us. And that's the power of the opening words of this psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Notice what he says. He doesn't say the Lord is a shepherd. He said he's mine. He's my shepherd. Amen. He makes me lie down on green pastures. He leads me. Sometimes I use my phone for directions. Remember anybody else do that? We all do. Just so handy anyway. You notice know, people aren't even stop and ask for directions anymore. They all have their phones. And if I want to find my destination, I'll say something like 120 Anborn Drive, West Mifflin, PA. I'll punch a couple buttons and it'll direct me to my destination. Most of the time. <laughs> but sometimes my phone won't tell me until I've already made a commitment. I start to bear right and it says, make this left. There it goes, you know. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've had to turn around somewhere because my phone didn't correctly lead me to where I needed to go. And, and why does it do that? Why does it let me down? Well, it's just a dumb phone. I mean, it's a collection of parts. They don't, these parts can be programmed and these parts can direct, but they don't think. God is different. God not only thinks, he knows where you need to go. And he will lead you through the valley of shadows, doubts. And one last thought. David called this place of doubt and fear the valley of the shadow of death. He didn't call it the valley of death. He said the valley of the shadow of death. And what causes shadows? Shadows are caused by something that is near me. The reason the Kidron Valley is dark most of the time is because it's deep and narrow. The walls of the canyon close in on the valley. The shadow is caused by the nearness of the walls of the canyon. And the Bible is very honest with us. It tells us that things in this world crowd in on us. They seem to make us feel trapped. In a world like that, when a world is like that for you and I, Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. It's going to be rough, guys. God makes it very clear that it is not going to be an easy walk. It never will be. In this world you're going to have trouble. But don't worry, I've already beaten the world. We live in a world that's damaged by sin. It's broken. We walk in the shadows an awful lot. Fear, doubt, death. But take heart. Jesus has overcome the world. He's with us. He will defend us. He will lead us. He will never leave us. He is the good shepherd. Amen. But there's something else about shadows. One person said it this way, never fear shadows. They simply mean that there's a light shining nearby. Hmm. A young mother, she's putting her daughter to bed one night. Her husband was gone, they were there all alone, and 
sort of windy. You could hear the wind howling through the trees. And the mother and the daughter, they were a little uneasy, and the mom's trying to hide her fear. And the young girl asked her, that it, is the moon god's night light? And the mother thought that sounded cute, so she said, yes, dear. And the girl said, does God turn out his light when he goes to sleep? And the mother continued, she said, well, no, honey, God never sleeps. And the child quietly said, well, then, if God's going to stay up all night, there's no sense in both of us staying awake. And that gentle faith of a child is what enabled her to turn over and go to sleep. She knew that God would be there for her. His light was the proof. Because Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you have taught us that you have indeed overcome the world, that you have overcome death, that death, you say, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Lord, we know as your word promises us that for those who have given their heart to you, their last breath here on earth is immediately followed by looking into your eyes and being welcomed into heaven. So Lord, we thank you that we have that knowledge that can reassure us in times like this. We pray, dear Lord, that we will take that knowledge with us, that that knowledge will not only will not only assure us, but will also give us a drive to help others who may have a fear. That us knowing that we will go to heaven when we die, that death on earth is merely a, a transition into a much better world, that that incredible news will become something that we are unable to not share with the people we come across. Dear Lord, we thank you for delivering us, for this redemption, for this knowledge, for this assurance that we belong to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.